Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth event in our new series, Your Path to Farm Transition. My name is Joel Bokenford, uh, one of our farm business advisors with Farm Credit Canada, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. And so as we go through today, this series is called Your Path to Farm Transition for a reason. Our teams met with families from across Canada, and we appreciate that so many farms are looking for the right way to transition, um, sort of a set path, but Often for those of us involved in transition, although a farm might be similar, we're gonna make slightly different choices. The people involved are gonna have different uh, outcomes that they wanna pursue. And it really is a, uh, something that is unique to you and I often describe it a little like avoiding a polar bear in a snowstorm, right? You can kind of spot the edges, see where you're going. But our hope with this series is that it's really gonna help kind of guide you down the right path uh, to where that, uh, to avoiding where that polar bear is, I guess. But, and as I mentioned, this is our fourth session in this series. And this one's all about building a farm transition team. And so often, I think in our discussions, we see uh, so often farms look at it and we think one person's gonna have all these answers for us that's gonna tell us the right way to do things. But we find, um, you know, it really does take a team approach to help uh, brainstorm, uh, share ideas with and plan for your farm transition journey. And sometimes we feel like as farmers that, um, we want to have all the answers before we go and, and bring it in that we want to have it kind of packaged up or have our part of it done and often best practice is to kind of get a team involved early um, and help them uh, brainstorm and, and be part of that team to help you make your decisions as you go forward. And so with that and without further ado, uh, I got to play a little bit of uh, fantasy farm transition manager here and draft a team that's going to help me through this plan to help uh, help guide us through this presentation today. And so they're uh, highly, highly experienced in their professional areas and lots of experience working with farm families uh, across Canada and wanted to have them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about them uh, so that they can lead into our presentation. So here are our teams popped up on camera here. Uh, maybe Jolene, I'll start with you. Would you mind telling me a, a little bit about yourself? Uh, hi, Joel. I'm Jolene Boulding. I'm a senior relationship manager out of our Cameras Alberta office. I've been in the lending industry for over 20 years, and I've been, um, I've had the pleasure to work with many farms as they work through a successful transition and, and had some uh, opportunities to see where, you know, it would have been nice to have the transition start a little sooner or um, start the process a little sooner. So thanks for having me. Really looking forward to it. Uh, Reed, could we go to you next? Thanks, Joel. My name is Reed Wilkie. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, agriculture lawyer based in Southeast Alberta in Medicine Hat, but uh, I run offices in little towns, both Concert and Oyen, and travel extensively. I used to say just Southern Alberta, but I've making my way into Saskatchewan, even into Central Alberta quite a bit. So I put a lot of kilometers on. My background is actually a construction worker. I did that for 10 years and uh, got tired of freezing my hands over and over and uh, graduated into uh, practicing a little bit of law, so to speak. So thanks for having me. Definitely looking forward to it. And, and uh, last but not least on the list, uh, Kari, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself as well? Hi, Joel. Thanks for letting us, uh, letting me come today. Um, so I'm originally from Southern Alberta, growing up on a farm there and gravitated to Northern Alberta. And I've been working about 30 years um, uh, with farm families, business families on su succession planning and, and working with generational wealth. Um, our, uh, our focus has really become um, that estate planning aspect and what does it look like long term, but as well just trying to get the stress down for families on how to get from point A to point B. So uh, yeah, I look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, thank you. And I'm really excited as well. We've got a great team here and, uh, and kind of spanning the gamut a little bit, uh, wanted to reach out and, and there's uh, many advisors that can be involved in a farm transition plan, but uh, often with the lending, the legal, and the accounting uh, and advisory side, there's so many places that cross paths. It'll be nice to get some great perspective from kind of across the board here. Um, first question, we're going to jump right into things. Uh, hoping to hear from everybody a little bit in your experience. What do you see that's challenging about farms uh, reaching out to kind of seek assistance when planning? And, and Reed, maybe I'll start with yourself, if you wouldn't mind. Um, You'd have a couple things. One would be they're not sure what to do. They, they have some ideas, but they don't really know which one they want to pursue. Um, secondly, it's not pressing. Um, it's not like you got to get the seed in by X date. 
it's a matter that's important, but you know, we, I'll put it off next year. Uh, we'll talk about it, you know, after after spring. So we'll talk about it after harvest, and so it keeps getting pushed off. Um, usually until there's some you know critical event. Unfortunately, sometimes those critical events can make it uh, hard to succession plan from. So I would say, um, yeah, those would be some of the two big factors. And Jolene, I guess, kind of jumping over, swinging things your way, kind of from the lending side of the things, things as well that you see that, you know, farms often, uh, uh, you know, find it challenging to kind of reach out to get some support for, uh, for farm transition planning or to build a team. Um, I would say a lot of the challenge can come with cost. They're concerned about what, what it will cost, um, making, finding out where they should start. I think that's always a bit of a challenge. It's do, what do we do first? Who do we talk to first? Um, and then, you know, we've been fortunate to have your transition team and specialists to kind of help guide our, our clients. So that's been a good, good start. Absolutely, absolutely. Appreciate the plug. I'll, I'll pay you later on that one too. But, uh, um, right. I think you know, cost can be a, can be a concern. And and Kari, I know, like I, I I've joked with you offline too. Whenever we don't, uh, whenever we're not certain of something, um, I say, oh, that's a really good question. You should ask your accountant, um, uh, right, to try to you know descend that way. So you get you guys kind of get pulled into lots too. But are there things you see from your kind of angle of it as well that um, you know farms anything kind of less on that list? Yeah, and I think I agree both with Reed and Jolene, and and it's the the worry too that maybe opening Pandora's box, you know, you just there just seems to be such a, a a big stress level in preserving legacy and wealth, trying to pass things on to a generation, and so um, it it's really working with the the advisors, but also looking at oh okay, well if I bring all my advisors together, how much is this really going to cost me, and yet. Um, from our side, we're just seeing such great effective work if you can get the team working together. And so um, I do think it's it's a roadblock and a concern of having too many professionals in the room at the same time and, and how that's going to impact from a cost basis. But really at the end result, I think there's an incredible um, strategy that can come up with when you have those heads all in the same room and they're working for you. Yeah, and I, th I think those are some excellent points that we touched on, um, right, in terms of getting treated like event-based and, right, and cost and fees. And sometimes there's a danger of, of, of not doing that. I guess um, I'd be curious again if, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll come back to you, Kari, to start things off. But if you're kind of looking at it as a member in your profession, um, you know, how should an advisor in that profession, and I, and I guess your chance to speak on behalf of the industry, but look to maybe add value uh, to a farm in that, in that scenario? Yeah, it, I think it really happens a lot with tax advisors. We, you know, we do your tax return. We're talking about maybe operational things, helping with cash flow, facilitating some lending. But those advisors that are asking the curious questions and really listening to where do you want to go in the future, that's who's going to sit along your team in true transition and work effectively with the other advisors that you have in your camp and with your other generations of your family. So, um, that's your most trusted circle of supporters for your farm. And you want to make sure that uh, you've got the best people that are really um, on it, on it for your purposes versus maybe what their, their uh, prescriptive agenda might be, because it, it can happen. Um, there's lots of times where a prescribed result is considered, but that might not be the best fit for your family. So. Absolutely. And, and uh, Jolene, I'd, I'd uh, ask you kind of the same question too, if uh, like any thoughts that come to mind on how, you know, if a farm's got the right fit there for them as an advisor or right, or kind of in that lending relationship as well. Um, you know, how, how is a, you know, that, uh, that role looking to add value to that farm operation? Um, I think that if the, the team is curious about what uh, what they want, what that family wants, what the farm wants long term, and it builds a a unique structure to to fit the needs of that particular business and and farm because it all has to go together. Um, and I think getting collaboration between between your team and advisors sooner than later can sure help um, help with how it how it continues. So. 
And I know some we've chatted about Jolene a little bit that is like, oh, it'd be nice to know if I had this information ahead of time, right? It would be nice to know what what kind of plan is unfolding. I guess any thoughts there too that uh, kind of come to mind for you? Yeah, one of the things that we had talked about was, um, you know, if if the lender knows how how the new structure is going to look, you know, if we're doing a whole co and an op co, um, then we can set up, you know, operating lines or or loans and lending to make it a smooth transition versus trying to do those things at the ninth hour and you know you're trying to get your your inputs bought and you're trying to do it under a new company name or something. Um, it definitely helps the sooner we know the, the sooner we can get the right structure for for the farm transition. And Reed, I'd kind of kind of swing up to you. Like we've we've kicked that around too, right? I know we were talking about one of the questions a lot is, you know, farms that are asking, you know, how do I know if I've got a good advisor, a good, right, uh, a good lawyer and, and things like that, I guess, curious for your thoughts or perspective on that. That's a great question. Um, you know, because if you ask, you know, someone, you know, do you do farm, do it, do succession planning, you're, you're going to find a tremendous number of individuals say yes. Um, you know, every bank, lending institution, um, investors, you know, all kinds of people are going to say yes. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're the right one for you, certainly. It doesn't mean they understand agriculture. Um, in some cases, it just might mean they understand their certain portion of it. So finding out who who works for you is, that's a, that's a big question. And uh, I would say a couple of things that to factor in and trying to figure out, do I have the right person is, uh, first off, you got, got to enjoy working with them a bit. You know, it's the you know, succession planning rarely gets done in you know one meeting. Um, in fact, I don't think I've got any that happen in one meeting. So you should enjoy working with the person. Um, you know, secondly, they should be listening. Uh, yeah, everyone says that, but they should be listening instead of going, you know, this is my cookie cutter answer. This is my cookie cutter structure that I kind of want to push you in because it's fast and it's easy. They should be listening to what you're saying. Um, secondly, they need to be making suggestions um, and suggestions you can actually understand, which can be a problem for some professionals. Um, do, you, do you get what they're saying? Do they make it relatable? Um, do they, can you actually understand going, I, I know what I'm doing here? Um, and then they should be asking a lot of questions. I would say on a, for a good succession planning, whether it's lender, accountant, lawyer, um, you know, the technical aspect of the plan, while very important and essential, the soft issues is really where things are going to live and die. And you have to figure out how to draft the technical plan in light of what the issues are on your farm. So they should be asking questions about, you know, how well do the to uh, do you get along with your in-laws? How well do you get along with uh, your daughter-in-laws, your brother-in-laws? Um, you know, does everybody in the farm have the same vision for how, um, what we're going to be doing in the future for expansion, for debt, all those kind of things, because that's going to matter. It's their job then listening, asking questions and listening to kind of propose, here's some different solutions for you. So if you're not, if you're not getting that, you, sh you don't really want to have like a lawyer, for example, all they do is just follow the instructions the accountants gives that that's not giving a lot of value. So yeah, like said, a lot of, a lot of questions and they should be questions about the, in the dynamic of how your farm works. And, and if they're coming in and maybe they don't, are there, um, um, are there any thoughts there on uh, them interviewing their professional a little bit, some key questions that they might be able to ask um, just to make sure they can kind of cement that relationship? And Reed, I'll maybe, while we're on you, I'll maybe stick with you with that one. Well, I think you get got the right question. It, the term is, the term is interview um, because, um, yeah, you want to be comfortable with the person. You got to um, in some cases, I'll have a couple interviews. Someone will come in, dad will come in first, chat with me. Is he comfortable? And he'll say, you know what? I want my, I want my son, my farming son and my wife to come meet you. Or, or in many cases, I'll drive out to the farm. Then they're going to kind of pop, um, pop, propose going, here's kind of what we're thinking on doing. What would be some of your suggestions? Well, you know, what, what, what do you think this is going to look like? Cause they're, and, and the feedback they should be looking for, like I said, they should, first off, you got to understand it. You know, I, I often hear when people leave them, you know, the professionals and say, and I think they're really smart. I, I think I'm sure it was a good plan, but I don't quite know what we're doing or what the plan. That, you know, that's not a good option. And not that you got to ever get every nut and bolt, but you should. They should be able to explain it to you, so you're comfortable and know what you're doing moving forward. So I'd say that would be um, one of the big factors. Perfect. And and some we touched on on there a little bit is you know farms can be quick to maybe jump on, and, and maybe that's an unfair comment, but. Um, jump on, right? That there's a quick answer here that we can solve it if we put the right thing in place. Um, I guess I'd be curious, uh, uh, Kari, if you'd kind of elaborate just a little bit on that, does it take, you know, that teamwork in transition between professionals? Um, curious if you'd elaborate a little bit for us on that one. Yeah, 
A hundred percent. I have a great example. I met with a farm family in the last year or so um, that I hadn't worked with before, and they had been prescribed a solution to save tax. And it was a complex family, a number of families involved. Um, the process was very complex, just like Reed said, it, it was difficult maybe to really understand all the technical part that was behind it. And it affected a lot of family units. And when I arrived, um, the lead generation um, uh, grandfather had passed and the will brought surprises that no one contemplated. And, and I think that's where really that multi-advisory work and talking with farm families, what does the long term look like? And making sure that your advisors are taking enough time to look at the background information because those wills change the whole landscape of what all that tax planning did and nothing had been contemplated in that regard and there was a disconnect. And so, um, you know, really having your advisors dig in to where do you wanna go? And like Reed said, thinking really long term and that they're gonna be with you long term. Um, or, and you want them to be with you long term. So, you know, that interview process uh, is what you can discover and decide, are these the people you want to be working with or not? So. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great point, right? Is that, um, right, the, the getting that holistic touch to it. Um, and sometimes that does involve, you know, more than more than what we have here. And, and Jolene, I might come to you with this next one here that, um, you know, along that theme, I guess we've got a, we've got a team here, but, you uh, uh, you know, you're kind of in, in constant contact with lots of your clients, I think. Are there other professionals that maybe aren't on our current team that we formed here for the next uh, 40 minutes or so that um, you commonly see farms bring in? Are there certain professionals you see that uh, do add some value that farms are maybe struggling in a place or having some things that they could look to bring in as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, talking to your accountant and your lawyer, and the team we have here is very important and a great um, place to start, but there is situations or, you know, it's a family dynamic, it's your family farm. And, and you know, if the communication is kind of broke down or it's, it's not really going anywhere, definitely the use of like mediation or um, those types of things can be brought in to keep the communication going and, and moving ahead, um, depending on what, uh, where the farm is sitting that you know we can look at some investment advisors as well to to kind of handle that side of it but yeah there's definitely other people that need to be involved in the in the process when the situation calls for that if you don't mind me jumping in joel i think sometimes the counseling aspect comes forward to families are dealing with all sorts of dynamics that may or may not have been there in the past and unique and whether it's family mediation or counseling to support someone that may have something that is off farm um, issues or, or, or very personal issues so that that can be dealt with to help the farm move forward. Um, your team should be able to bring that in as well. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, I think great point, right? In, in both those cases, right? It's that there's, there's genuine, like we'll, we'll make the, have to make the decision as a family, but there are people that can come in to support that need at that time. And, um, I think farms get um, cautious a little bit on, you know, on who they bring in or who they share their plans with and open up to, but it, it becomes something that the more I think they do that, they, it really can help kind of leapfrog their, their plan a bit to head. Um, Reed, anybody else kind of come into mind too? I know you, you deal with lots that are considering expansion plans and things like that too, as, as part of it and kind of making sure those numbers come uh, to make sense, but anything coming to mind there too that you see? Yeah, so you'd have a couple <clears throat> professionals that would regularly um, be in the mix, depending on what stage they're at. So a common one that uh, all the time is you get, you have mom and dad, they're not ready to transition the farm over, but they're starting to have a conversation with, uh, you know, their, their son or their daughter. And, uh, you know, so my question is often going, well, what are they paying? Are we giving this to them? Are we giving them a portion? Are they paying, you know, un under market value? I'd say there's very few that pay full market value. It's not real vi very viable anymore. But um, and the mom and dad are often kind of, I, I don't know, I don't know how much I need. Um, you know, so there's some ways to work with that, but sometimes a financial planner, um, especially one who's been with them for a while, can be quite helpful because they can give them an accurate representation of going, here's what living expenses look like. Here's, here's realistically what you might be able to expect, um, on return. If we take a lump sum payment from the kids, 
uh, what kind of return can we get, um, you know, depending on risk. So it's, it's nice when you have someone like that who's working there um, with them. Um, I would also say I, I've had, uh, you know, depending on the, what the stage in the plan is, sometimes if you get early enough, maybe we're buying life insurance, depending on, you know, that sometimes works for families. So you have a, if you have a good, good life insurance person, not the person who came and just knocked on their door cold calling, but, you know, someone who's really an excellent, excellent in that field can give them advice on here's different types of insurance that might work. Maybe we end up doing it, maybe we don't, but at least it's some good, um, some good advice. So I'd say those would be two other ones that I have here from. Perfect. Appreciate it. And, and I do want to take this and I guess kind of dive into the meat a little bit here and kind of take it back to our roles, right? There are, you know, lots of people that can come in and complement a plan, but what I thought would be fun is if we chatted about a little bit of a case. So we have a, we have two case studies I want to walk through. And I guess um, sometimes farms, I think even knowing where to start or what should I bring in that would make my professional's life easier too, can be a big conversation and go a long ways. And just want to talk a little bit about what a farm could look at when they're just starting out. So I, I'd, I'd uh, maybe get everybody to envision that client that they're just getting to work with and they're just starting that farm plan and they're asking about farm transition. Um, right. We don't have a clear goals yet, but maybe the, the junior gen is starting to show up on the farm a little bit more and we're just starting to plan. Um, I'm wondering if uh, we could speak to our profession specifically, what, what a conversation with a professional would look like um, kind of on behalf of your profession and what they could bring to you that, would really help you understand what they want to go and what they're struggling with at that, at that current time. And uh, uh, Kari, maybe I'll start with you on this one. Sure. Yeah, and, um, it's it's great working with the second, even third generation now of some of the farms that I've been involved with, and and um, I, I I'm really uh, impressed on how much more educated they are on what do I need to bring, what are some of the new innovations, what is some of the new technology, but. The basics is the financial information. Where are you at right now? What are you kind of doing to keep track of what's going on with the farm? What are the input costs? Um, what would you like to achieve in the next five years? Um, where would you like to go? What's happening with your family? Um, getting some of those basics down. Uh, often I'll give a checklist to my cl new clients that are starting out and not much different than new businesses starting. Then here's some of the basic things. Let's just see where you're at. And then we can figure out, okay, from there, where would you like to go? And if you can't, if, if we can't quite perceive you're going to get there yet, well, what, what steps need to happen to, to make it get there? So, and, and anything stand out there too, like from that accounting side, you know, that, you know, that the next gen, like you mentioned, um, you, you know, I guess it's, there's always a thing, oh, that's, uh, you know, that's mom and dad's advisor, yeah. right? Are we getting a fair shake on this as well? Are there things there that, come to mind yeah first. first i mean really getting organized and helping them to understand what income and expenses are but also what their balance sheet looks like what are, what are what are your assets right now and what are your liabilities and and just just learning the terms and and understanding okay here's how we track what we do from year to year so as well we can see whether we have growth or not growth um and uh and set some goals Joel, I would uh, to jump in on what uh, what Kari said there. You'd asked the earlier question, how do you know you have a good um, a good advisor? This would be a great example where um, you should have an advisor who's willing to sit and explain some of those things. Um, I could, I can think of I had a, had a young guy come into my office, great, yeah, you know, sharp guy. And he even said to me, he said, Reed, he goes, I don't I don't have anything specific I'm coming in for, but I have all these different ideas. Eventually, I'm getting the farm from mom and dad, and maybe from grandma and grandpa. And I got these different ideas. I don't know if they make sense. I don't even know how to structure this. Um, and he was very upfront. He says, he goes, I don't have much money to pay you. Um, so I told him, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll give you an hour of my time for free. Because um, I could tell this guy's a, you know, he's ambitious. Um, he's very smart. I said, um, you know, and you know, from a selfish point of view, to be honest, you go, you know what? He, I'm going to be around here a long time. So is he? I'll probably end up working with him. And uh, so I sat there for an hour. We talked structure. We talked different strategies on land bids. Um, all kinds of different things and uh, gave him a bunch of time. I know many accountants will do the same thing. They'll walk the, the junior farmer through here's, here's financials, here's financial statements, here's what these different things mean. Um, and the, a good advisor should be doing that. You shouldn't, and, and you should be comfortable to ask him that. Right. And, and, and while we're, while you're kind of here, I, I do want to stick on, on this point a little bit too. I know you mentioned, um, or, you know, we talked about uh, farm transition sometimes being event-based or things like that, right. That, uh, 
oh no, there's a wedding, right? We got to rush in, get a prenup, or we got to rush in, get a will done, right? That um, we haven't done this. Um, and we hit this milestone of 65 and now things are changing, but kind of from, from the legal profession uh, as well, Reed, like are there certain specific things that in this case that somebody brought into you would really make a difference that, um, you know, if they've got this, what really helps support you, I guess, on the right plan? Yeah, so I, I'll give an example. I had someone come in uh, last week, um, a client referral, brand new client, never met with them. So they sat down. First off, they, you know, they have a general idea of what you own. That's, that might sound obvious, but you'll know, ask someone like, uh, you know, do you have a company? Uh, yes, they usually know that. Is all your cattle equipment and inventory in the company or land? Um, you know, sometimes they're not sure. So no, knowing what's owned by who, because that's going to change the structure tremendously. Um, you know, are you, you know, uh, like, like Kari said, what are you trying to do? And I'll give you some examples of that. Are we trying to put a will in place because mom and dad are still involved? They still want to be around for a long time. Um, and they're not looking to get out, but they just want to have a will that if, you know, as I said, if they got run over by a tractor, it's not going to be a disaster. You know, they've got their own, they want to transition from that traditional will that they draft when their kids were young that says equally divided between the kids. That's not the plan anymore. Well, all right, then what we're doing there is we're putting a will together saying here's in a critical event, here's what's going to happen. Um, you know, that's going to transition, you know, whereas if they sit, come in and say, um, I need a new will, but I'm also looking to take a step back. I only want to be there for seeding and harvest. Um, and we're going to transition some control. Okay, well, we're doing a will and we're doing some other things. So what their, what their goal is um, for themselves, they don't need exact dates, but if they have a bit of an idea, you know, or I want to be out within five years or down to part-time in five years, okay, we can, we can work with that. So a timeline is very important because that's going to dictate what kind of documents and what kind of plan gets put into place. It's always nice working with time. Um, the person who says, uh, you know, I'm going on vacation in a week and a half and my will is a disaster, <laughs> or I've had the ones, you know, I'm going in for open heart surgery in a week and I've got a farm of X number of thousands or tens of thousands of acres and the current will is no good. I will say, all right, we'll put something together. And I used to try to book him in like the next day or even later that day and I'll quickly draft it, but you're not getting a great plan. We're just trying to avoid a terrible plan at that point, but time is nice. Yeah, but I, I think that is a good, right? I mean, there are options within plans, right? So there's, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, uh, the, right, that holiday will, right? Let's get it done. Let's get something in place. So you're not leaving it all out there because sometimes it can be a little paralyzing to start to think about what do I really want to get achieved, right? And where it's kind of, yeah, making progress rather than perfection. And, and Jolene, I'd maybe jump to you in the same question. I know like it becomes so important for you to know where your clients' businesses are going and things like that as well. But are there, like, is there starting to talk about transition or or expansion in to be able to do that? Are there things that um, come to mind for you on that one in that first case where the next gen's just starting to come in, right? It's like who takes the debt and things like that, I guess. Uh, curious for your perspective on it. I think um, both have already spoke to most of the, the tools that I'd like, you know, it'd be nice to have brought in. Um, financial statements, what you owe, what you own, um, and and the plan of what, uh, who wants to be carrying the debt going forward, or who's going to own the assets going forward, um, and structure so we're able to structure it long term in the right direction versus um, possibly having all the debts or something staying in in the first gen until until we get to the end, but. Um, so yeah, definitely financial statements, tax returns, um, a bit of a legal plan. And for me, when a customer can bring me their accountant and, and lawyer's name and number, and we can have collaboration between the three of us, it makes it a lot easier too. So um, I always try to get that info. Right. And identifying those other professionals that are involved, right? So there can be a little bit of sharing. Um... And I, and I guess I'd be curious, I guess, kind of move it along. Let's say we're, we're maybe 10 years down the road for now, right? As we kind of evolve in this, uh, this case study. And now we're in a place where, um, you know, there might be a little bit of friction that's getting introduced to the plan. We'll go with maybe the classic case that uh, mom and dad, you know, have, have indicated they want to do a transition. We're uh, farther down the road and, um, you know, maybe having a little bit of trouble letting go of the farm or transferring things in or, or making progress, right? Maybe some things have changed in our mind and the junior gen's coming in now and they have kids of their own and their own concerns. Um, kind of, again, going back to that, speaking on behalf of your, your profession a little bit, 
what might change in your plan that uh, that could go forward? And and Jolene, I hope not to pick on you right away again, but I'm wondering if we could start with you and just kind of go back to that. We're farther down the road. Are there things there that might change for what you're going to structure again, or what kind of information you might uh, be useful for you? Yeah, um, definitely hearing both sides of, um, hearing from both parties, uh, Gen 1 and Gen, Gen 2 definitely can bring light on what each party has expectations are, I guess. Um, timelines, when you ask Gen 1, the timeline might be 10 years and Gen 2 is thinking it should be next week. So um, I, think, I think that can change the dynamic a little bit as well. Um, and then I think it's, um, they may have had more opportunity to, to, to start their plan. So, um, getting that background, especially if it's a new customer a background of what that plan looks like and, and again, collaboration between the team. Yeah, absolutely. I think get right. And then, and then also, right. That might be time to be going back out to other professionals as well. And, and maybe I'd lead back into that, uh, Rita, maybe kind of that same case. Then again, we're your clients a little bit farther down the road and, and things maybe aren't going to plan. Um, how, how could your advisor step in there to kind of help make some sense or in your role? How does it maybe change things a bit for you? Well, it can change it quite a bit. Um, the, uh, the, one of the biggest things it's uh, it can be the greatest frustration on an estate plan or sometimes the make it work, the work the best when they can be very frank about what their concerns are. Um, and sometimes that takes a meeting or two for them to be comfortable to really open up. Um, so when someone has certain concerns, you know, you can, there's often a plan that can address them, but they can't be addressed unless you know what they are. So let's, let's walk through a bunch of the classic ones. Um, you know, I'm concerned about my, you know, my inheriting son or inheriting daughter's marriage. You know, they've, they've and always, every farmer has a bunch of horror stories from somewhere around them that the farm got broken up or sold out or whatever, because of a divorce. That's a huge factor, especially with the number of zeros in the end of, uh, land prices, quota, et cetera. That, that has to, that even if that's not a concern of yours, that should be addressed in the plan. Um, control. Dad might say, you know what, I, I think I got a lot to offer. I don't mind switch transitioning planning, but I don't want to be out. Okay, we can work with that. Um, you know, let's say if you got multiple operators together, one son might go, I'm not real crazy, but working with my brother. I might like the guy, but uh, I don't want to run a business with him. Um, so a bunch of the different issues, you know, I usually want the client to say, all right, give me your top three concerns. Um, and be realistic. I, it's very frustrating when someone will say, ah, no, I'm sure it'll all go right. We just want a really basic will. I'm sure the family will get along. Um, you know, I, and I always tell them, I hope you're right. I really do. But it might be foolish to plan on that when, when the value of land or quota or equipment, um, is what it is. It's just, there's too many zeros to that, uh, you know, if you're wrong to be able to fix it. So knowing what the issues are, um, as the people are honestly concerned about are quite good. Um, very important. I would even say sometimes we keep circling back to, you know, someone will say, you know, well, tell us what your plan is. I, I've encountered it where a client doesn't really know what their plan is, but they can tell me what their plan isn't. And sometimes that can work to get there. If they say, you know what, I know my, this happened to this neighbor, this happened to my brother, this happened to the, I don't want these things. These are my concerns. And so they're sort of paralyzed because they're feeling, well, I don't want a divorce to blow up the farm. And I don't want my, you know, that my, my son to overspend and overextend himself. But then I heard, and so they can sometimes get stuck just because they have so many horror stories that they go, I'll just do nothing. Well, make no mistake. Doing nothing has its own cost. Sometimes an exceptionally high cost. I got, I'm sure the other presenters do have tons of horror stories of people who did nothing. But if someone comes and says, here's my concerns, that you can work with that. And sometimes you can work backwards and put a plan together. So even if you don't know exactly what you want to do, if you know what I don't want to do, you can sometimes get there too. Yeah. And I, and I always look at it like getting out of what if land a little bit, right? Getting out of what if land and, the, and that advisory team is really there to compliment you a little bit on, hey, maybe, maybe this concern you have isn't unsolvable that, um, um, right. There's things you can pull out there. And then as your point, uh, your point, right. It often becomes, uh, you know, like the movie Shrek, right. That, uh, succession plans have layers as well as ogres, right. That, um, <laughs> you start pulling at some threads and it's kind of that first plan we, we jumped into that, um, you know, might not work for us anymore. Um, Kari, I guess I'd be curious, kind of same question there. You're, you're a little farther wrapped down and, um, in the plan and, um, right. Things maybe aren't, aren't working there too. Is there anything that's kind of leading in there that Reed and Jolene covered as well? 
Yeah, I think it's very much like both of them have said, often the conversation's not happening because there's such a concern on on how it's going to one, either unfold as a conversation with everyone. Um, two, I think there's a sense of, okay, if I, if I put this all out there as the lead generation, am I losing control of what I've established as a farm? Um, and really the concern with farm families is, is maintaining that legacy. They, there's such a strong passion with families to keep what they built up as the farm and how it won't get broken up. And as Reed said, there's lots of very straightforward solutions if your concern is that there may be a potential divorce or even preserving it for not just generation two, but three and four, thinking long-term. And so from us, um, yes, tax strategies are always available, but without seeing what people really want as a long-term goal, you could save tax now, but you might inhibit what ha could happen later or do some estate planning now so that the tax is, in, is lowered significantly so that land doesn't have to be sold in order to pay a tax bill. And that, that's the part without a conversation, we're seeing what people are really worrying about. Estate taxes being talked about lots in politics and at the coffee shops. Is that gonna be something that's a big burden for families on transition of estates? And so pre, some families are pre-planning things or doing things in um, po the possibility of that happening. And maybe it's not to the biggest benefit of you and your family. And at this point in time, it's not, it's not on the docket, but there are ways to do it. Again, having a conversation. So uh, yeah. That, yeah, that absolutely. And our, and our session before this really spoke uh, and highlighted kind of uh, vision and values coming in and, and right, really knowing where we're going a little bit. Um, like, I guess, hearing from everybody that having that at, regardless of your professional, right, spending some time and getting kind of an opinion on that as well become so valuable for for everybody to provide kind of the best support to that farm because because it is amazing right I think you get in and um, you know there's a there's a technical plan crafted and three questions in things you can kind of shape that plan a little bit if uh, you know you ask some dangerous three questions um, I, I guess I'd be curious is there uh, as farms are thinking about this and they're thinking okay I'm, I'm building my transition team in these scenarios um, and uh, we, we don't have to all jump at once, but what advisor should they maybe go in and, and see first or, you know, in that kind of back to that first thing, how do they start to lay it back out um, properly, right? It takes a lot of family discussion to kind of get there eventually when, you know, you're trying to find something the whole family supports. But um, Kari, kind of while we're sticking with you on that one, is there somebody that you see them kind of go into first or, or maybe having that first conversation with their uh, accountant to kind of either either spin on that for yourself? Yeah, yeah, not to say mine, mine is first, but generally where, where where all the financial data may already be residing um, and a lot of the history. I know even for ourselves, we have a lot of land titles already pulled and, and doing things with estate planning. We've inventoried for a lot of our clients a lot more than just their tax returns and their corporate corporate financial statements, um, shareholders agreements, those kind of things. So if you don't have a legal advisor, Generally, that's a great place to start because a lot of that information may have been gathered already in conjunction with your tax advisor or accountant. Um, and uh, if not, I do see whether it's starting with a lawyer or us, both of us are trying to pull in a lot of that information just to get a good baseline to provide, whether it's you at the FCC team or, or other advisors that they might have assisting them um, and generally that's where the longer trusted relationship has started. Uh, so often that's where we're seeing those farm families initiate the conversations. Yeah. And uh, Angelina, maybe swing the same one you, your way. Like I know you get to be part of so many conversations about where the business wants to go and things like that, about what we're trying to get accomplished, I guess. Are there things there you see too that, hey, we've, you know, how we can help unpack some of these things a little bit, but uh, kind of building that team to you. Um, when they broach it to you, I guess, what is it, um, do you have some of those key questions when they first bring it up that maybe stick out to you? Um, I was just gonna say, uh, one of the things that we do see is um, 
the person that's trusted. So if they have a trusted lawyer, they have a trusted accountant or a trusted lender, they usually go to that person that they have the longest relationship with first, right? Um, which is which is a great place to start and then and then um, work together. But a um, couple questions that I I always ask is, where are you now? Where are you sitting today? Like, what does this situation look like? And where do you want it to go? And what does that look like? And not just, not just tomorrow or, you know, after harvest, it's, it's um, in 10 years and for the, you know, for the grandkids or, you know, even further down the line is, is the legacy of the farm the most important or is keeping the family happy the most important? And, and sometimes those questions can lead to, to different answers than what, you know, what are, what are each of the parties thinking versus get that communication out. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and I, and it speaks to me, I know whenever we've like, it is that, that value of getting the whole family to try to pick a path and, and work on something together so that, you know, like to your point, right, there is some family harmony there uh, along with the chosen path, right. That, the that uh, they get to support the plan that they help build. Um, and, and Reed, I guess I'd be, I'd be curious kind of from a, from a legal perspective on this too, right. I, uh, like, I'm not hate to pick on you and I know, but just in my work, sometimes, you know, lawyers, it gets to be a little bit, um, right. Like, Oh, like they want this big event to happen that they sometimes I get brought in, but I guess be curious, you're starting things on the legal profession. You've spoken lots of good questioning and things like that, but just kind of that same along that same line, what comes to mind for you, I guess, is come in, what helps you move forward and, and get prepared for that? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, so I would say first off would be what, you know, someone says, where are you, where are you trying to go? That's a broad question. And also I sometimes try to provide a little more detail for the client. Okay. What's, what's your number one priority? Are we trying to pay off debt? Okay. Um, sometimes for a, like a livestock operator, maybe we were trying to re, um, expand the herd, build it back up to capacity. All right, maybe we have an uncle we know some point in the next 15 years doesn't have a successor and he's probably going to put his land up for sale. Um, or, you know, what, whatever, what's, what's that scenario? Or we got a, you know, I've got my son who just quit the oil field. He came back and he wants to farm, but he's only been back for half a year, but it's going well. Okay, so what's, what's the pressing matter? Um, what are we trying to do? So like, where, where, where are we going? That's sort of some of the, the, the putting, trying to put legs to that question. Next would be... Um, to what Jolene said is what is the, what we have to give a priority because the reality is with, with uh, succession planning, the farm is best if it pays no money out to any non-farmers, you know, that's going to leave most money on the operation for it to expand, pay off debt, grow. But I know practically that doesn't work. We're going to have to provide some, something to the non-farmers. Um, so it's always trying to go, what kind of balance are we, are we holding here between, um, you know, the viability of the farm, because if, if everyone's just going to get traded dollar for dollar equal, um, I have yet to see a farm survive that. You know, they just don't cash flow enough, land's worth too much, quotas worth too much, it's going to get sold. So we're trying to balance family harmony and the viability of the farm. Um, and so I would say that's that's probably one of the biggest questions. And so trying to provide some solutions, one of, one of my solutions, it's not a solution, but it's a different way of looking at it. I usually try to tell the client, let's try to get away from what the dollar figure of the farm is worth on paper. Because if it, you know, whether if it's worth five million or ten million or thirty-five million, it still grows the same amount of canola, feeds the same number of cows, whatever it is. What is the cash flow? What's the revenue of this? Because um, that's going to determine what are you giving to your successive generation. Are we giving them a, an operation that makes a ton of money? Well, okay, maybe we can't afford to pay out a lot more. But if you're giving them maybe a really valuable operation that doesn't make any money, wh why would we want to try and saddle it with another humongous payment? No. So in that case, then I suggest, well, if we're going to give this cash strapped operation, it's worth a lot of money. Maybe we need to be focusing on making sure that the successive generation doesn't, doesn't sell it quickly because, you know, everyone might be okay with the plan until, you know, farming, farming child goes, farms it for a couple of years and sells it. So those are some of the, try, the legs that I try to put to the question and, and, uh, you know, circling back to a good advisor. I think a good advisor should be not just go, what's your plan? You know, they try to flush it out and actually help you realize, because sometimes the client just doesn't even know. Absolutely right. Like it's a big puzzle to try to unpack because there are all those what ifs that we're dealing with, right? And so it is taking perspectives, right? And and kind of channeling it through, um, right? To get that advice and input. The, to Kari's point, it's great when the advisors talk because uh, you know I'll I'll you know I'll use, I always ask who's your accountant, so I'll call the accountant 
And sometimes the accountant will tell me, oh, okay, you know, they're dealing with a big tax problem here. I'll talk to the banker. And sometimes the, the other advisors, sometimes maybe are forthright. They're going, uh, oh, yeah, this, this client is, you know, behind in their payments. Like, or, you know, I've asked that odd time the banker says, oh, you know, and the client didn't want to brag. Go, this, this client hardly even touches the revolving line. They're approved for all this. But they pay cash for everything. You go, okay, all right. Well, that's good to know uh, one way or the other. So you, your, your advisors should be chatting. Um, so not putting the client in the middle. So the client's not stuck conveying messages or, um, and sometimes it's hard to be, you know, totally frank too. Right. Otherwise it becomes a little like the telephone game, right? Like this yeah. person said, and this is this, right? And nobody understands what the accountants really say anyways, right, Kari? So it's hard for no, them to convey that. No, not at all. <laughs> we try our best. We're getting better. <laughs> I had to bug you a little bit. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and that, as we're as we're thinking about that, right? Like I guess to me it's um, you know, it's 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 speaking a bit to the value of of getting things in writing a little bit, but I guess are there any tools that you work with your clients on at all that um you know, that really helps, helps convey those messages, right? And maybe it is talking directly, but, you know, if um, we're looking and we're building this team, right, it is, it's so easy to get siloed in what we do sometimes that we say, oh, okay, I'm going to do this and that, and that's not part of what I do, right? But are there tools you use as professionals that, um, you know, a farm can maybe start or get something drafted or help kind of move things around that does make it much easier if they walk in with, something that uh that kind of moves it forward and, and kari i'd maybe start i uh i keep trying not to go clockwise it's so it's so hard not to <laughs> so we'll do counterclockwise this time but uh kari are there things for you that stick out there that yeah help communicate to other professionals or that a family can can use as kind of an anchor yeah we've uh we, we have, we've used this in the past and then we we found a model that just works really good it's called a one-page plan but essentially just putting your your vision and core values um, and you can do it individually as family members or, or um, uh, as a group um, and I'll give mind shop credit from for where that one page plan comes from but um, essentially putting those goals and values and then saying uh, or core core vision and values and then saying what are your goals as a family um, and or individually as individual families within the unit and based on those goals, um, then we can work on strategies uh, as an advisor. And it's nice because it's one page. Everybody can look at it. You can be reintroduced to it, but you can also be accountable to it and pick people. Okay, who's, if it's on the lending side, you know, we need to get some more lending and this is what's going to happen. Who's responsible for that and who's going to make sure that that gets done? Um, that, that idea of keeping it comprehensive, overseeing, but simple. Keep it simple. It's really helpful. Absolutely, and um, right, and and this is one I'm hoping that um, um, reader Jolene, if either of you want to jump in as well, too, right? Things that you see that work well, pulling that information, right? Like even um, right, knowing there is a will or something, Jolene. I know is right. It takes lots of risk, but I guess kind of anything for you that stands out there as well that helps keep some cohesiveness with professionals. Yeah, definitely knowing what what they have started and what they're what they're working on, and and if they're comfortable with us communicating, right, then it definitely makes it easier. If the you know the lawyer knows what we're using the security, and the accountant knows what the loan details are, and and we keep it as as uh, free flowing as possible, it definitely definitely helps keep the technical side, you know, and the telephone game out of the way. Your, yeah. profession, your professional should have a little bit of overlap. By overlap, I don't mean they're doing each other's jobs. Like I always tell my clients, like I'm not an accountant, I don't crunch any numbers, but if you have an estate planning lawyer who doesn't understand tax at all, it's not going to be helpful. Like they should be able to have, you know, hey, you're going to get a poor will drafted, but other documents. So I can tell them, all right, here's how the, the, this principle and concept of tax works. That way, not every time we have a tax question, we're stopping going, oh, let's call the accountant. Similarly, the accountant has to have some legal understanding and knowledge of going, you know, here's that, this is, this is even doable. Is this allowed or not allowed? So you still work very collaboratively. It it's not, doesn't replace, but if someone is completely siloed going, as soon as tax is mentioned, the lawyer goes, nope, I don't know, call the accountant. Plan's going to take a long time and, and usually it's going to have some issues. Same, same thing with banking to the, to what to Jolene said, um, knowing what they're taking. Okay. This is what you can take. This is what you, you know, for example, in, uh, in central Alberta, 
um, the, the lease land, you know, it's, it's technically takeable as security, but it takes forever. So even, you know, the, you know, telling them, okay, this is just not going to be very viable um, on a timeline basis. So having a bit of overlap and expertise actually makes the plan go quite smoothly. And then I always say, I'm going to touch base with your accountant. You go, here's what I told them. Here's what I think is true. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then obviously the accountant fills in the details and vice versa. So at that, that helps the plan move smoothly and quickly. Absolutely. I think beautifully said. Um, I guess I, I, I'd be curious too, to just come back to that one because it is something that, uh, right, like I know in, in my world, um, often you hear uh, so much of, uh, right, and we, we did touch on it, but you hear so much of, okay, that's mom and dad's advisor. How do I know as the junior gen, I'm getting a fair shake? I guess I'd be, I'd be curious to come back to that one for you, Reed, too. I guess it's something, um, while we're on that one, I think Kari and Jolene spoke to it a little bit, but are there things there too that you try to pull out from that junior gen side? Um, or at least say, hey, if you've, you know, I understand mom and dad are the client, but this is what you're trying to get accomplished as a farm family. Is there things that stand out to you there too? Well, your, your advisor should be looking at more than just the senior generation or the clients that, you know, if you, if you do your job well, and hopefully the, the junior clients are then your clients as well. So they, you know, they definitely have a strong but important voice and as they should. Um, and I, yeah, I will very frankly say to them, okay, what, what are, what are your concerns here? And sometimes it's interesting. You'll get a phone call maybe after the family meeting and uh, one of the sons or one of the daughters calls and they'll say, you know, they, they don't want to say in the meeting, this is actually what I'm concerned about. You know, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't get along so well with my, with my brother's wife or this person or that person. Um, and so, you, you know, you're having to juggle all those things, but um, you know, if you, what I'd say, sometimes you do have different professionals at a real, real uh, a tough one between a, a father and a son, and there was there was zero trust. And so we actually did have, we had to use two separate lawyers on that transaction. Very time consuming. It's very difficult. But if you have a family that has some some trust, you know, of course, there's always the bumps, um, but it's, it's much more, um, it moves much better if it is the same advisor. Um, and really, you're, you're after a family, because a family, if a family gets along together, the odds of the family su you know, succeeding and carrying on are much higher. So the, your professionals are actually vested in making sure this plan works well. I'll have some people joke, I'm not a divorce lawyer, I'll do any of it. So they'll say, oh, you just want everyone to fight, you know, everyone to fight, you'll make more money. It's not quite the contrary. This actually goes way worse when people fight. I don't enjoy my job nearly as much and it's a, a much poorer result. So you're trying to get everyone to get along. No, absolutely. Um, and, and I will just, uh, if there are questions out there, drop them in the chat box. If you do want to talk a little bit about building that transition team, uh, drop them in that chat box. And I think we have time for a couple as well, but um, do you want to come back to as well? Just um, like, do you have any kind of thoughts that are bubbling up now as, as well, like uh, general transition advice or kind of, you know, it, it it's easy for that telephone game to happen, I guess. And we've talked about professionals doing it or coming in and, and there's always conversations a little bit of, um, you know, I went to my professional and they asked me what I wanted, um, right? How do I, how do I kind of anchor it in? But back to that line of questioning, if you had a farm kind of going through a process and writing it out, are there things that like if is having things kind of written down and put in writing of huge value to professionals so that they can kind of get something that everybody agrees there agrees to as well. Hopefully that's not too leading, I guess, but, uh, but, uh, Kari, I'd maybe start with you on that one as well. Yeah, a hundred percent written down. I think even it, so it's, it's a whole part of communication by having it written down, everybody's understanding the same thing. And it ensures that each generation plus the advisors have heard the same thing. Um, I find too often everybody says, yeah, we're in agreement. And then it gets on paper they're like, oh, that's not what I agreed to because they um, assumed or or just heard it differently because they're coming from a different place. So, you know, um, making notes clear, having clear strategies, goals, whatever it might be, but and concise and simple. Simplest can be, even though accountants aren't simple. So, yeah. And Jolene or Reed, anything standing out there for you as well? Sorry, I shouldn't have given two names. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would agree with what Kari said, is that the, the exercise of the family putting it on paper is very helpful because it forces them to have a conversation and make sure, you know, and find out, are they actually on the same page um, or not? So the exercise of doing that, you know, whether the actual piece of paper, how much it's used, it'd be, it's amazing how, 
how helpful that is that that perspective um yes a couple other things what else what other things could kind of be um you know stick out there's a couple key questions that i always like to ask um you know one of my, one of my questions is um if they're looking at land um and they go oh we want to equalize this and they have the idea of giving land to the non-farmers my first question is always have you talked to them do they want land um you know, and you'd be amazed how often they go, no, I've never asked them. Well, let's not give them land if they don't want it. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems we can solve if they don't. You know, secondly, question then is, do we need the land? If you're going to give them the land and the operation needs it, well, then it's going to, we have to put certain documentation to deal with those, with those issues. So that would be a common one. Um, you know, the ne next one is off often for the non-farmers. What, what do you want to get them? Are you looking to get them a certain percentage? Do you have a certain dollar figure? Do you want them to see be involved in the ownership? I usually caution against having non-farmers be involved in the ownership of the operating company. Legally very doable, practically not a great idea, in my opinion. But you know, so what what are you trying to get the non-farmers? So, so those are some of the big questions that I usually want someone wrestling with and thinking about ahead of time. Um, and then as we alluded to earlier, what's our timeline? You know, if we're just talking about maybe doing this in the in the future or in the future in five years, okay, that's great. We can plan with that. Or if this is something, this is something we want to have happen um, next month. So those would be some of the key questions that I often uh, I'm asking people. There, what's you know what what are we doing for the non farmers? If we're if it depends on what we're given, then we may have to put some agreements in place. Um, what do you need out of the operation, either on a, an annual cash flow basis or lump sum? Um, and what are the uh, what are the actual concerns we have realistically? Okay, and even if marriage is not one, it needs to be addressed. Yeah, and and I'm hearing a lot of like common themes there of right of just that ability to be a right the sounding board a little bit in caution that uh, as as it comes out to ask those good questions and and really pull things out. We do have our first uh, first kind of question here from from the chat. I do want to pull forward as well. So uh, the question was, how can a farm family figure out what advisors they are missing? or that they'd benefit from inviting the table. So, right, we've obviously got a core here, but um, how do they know, I guess, that they're missing an advisor? Um, Jolene, I'd maybe, I'd maybe toss this one your way, I guess, anything coming to mind that, uh, um, right, there might be somebody you see and they struggle with something and would really benefit from a, a different advisor or somebody that they're missing. Anything stand out from you with your clients? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think we can see um, in some instances that maybe, they need to maybe you need to change advisors or maybe bring other advisors to the table but you get that from the communication with the with the farm family and and when you see those situations um i usually take the opportunity to go you know i've seen this i've seen the situation in the past and this is how they've addressed it or this is you know who they've utilized um to help with that situation so trying to give them options um is always a good thing just from past from past history. So if your advisor can kind of point you in the right direction. Right. And help you make those connections. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And, um, and Kari, in, in your work, I guess, similar question, are there ways that like you see like, Hey, we don't have, um, I don't know, we need a, an agronomist at this table or we need somebody else that's not here. Anything stand out for you? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really understanding what what is their situation, what do they exactly need, and if you've got an advisor that is well involved in the farm community, especially in Alberta, Western Canada, wherever it might be, um, we we know other advisors, and so uh, that may have had history with a farm similar to yours. Also, talking to other farm families that have similar operations and have had success with generational transfers, asking them who their advisors are. And looking for those references uh, is also helpful. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I really appreciate the perspective. There's uh, honestly endless questions that uh, I think we could after ask you. There's a few more coming in the chat that uh, we might address at a, at a later point, but are going to wrap things up to today. So you will receive a recording link after this that will come out um, that captures all of this if you registered for today. Uh, as well as the entire series link. So this is part four. Our next event is going to be on November 8th, hosted by Patty Durand and uh, Tom Deans. And they'll be talking about all things wills and estate planning. Um, you will also receive an evaluation after this. And I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to Reed, Jolene, and Kari today for coming in and kind of sharing their expertise of working with farm families um, and really about building that transition team to get you support. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. 
uh, through your local FCC office uh, or directly through the evaluation as well. Thank you. Have a great day.